thinking about all these ideas running around in your head, can't make heads or tails as where you want to start your journey, pause, think about it with intentional thought, and consider where we go from here. Join our co-sponsors, Dom Dev Enterprises and Page Investments, and our friends down there at Islandese Realty D1 Development and Sami's Chicken. Let us know where you are, what you're thinking. Post your questions and share, 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 share this show with all your friends because we can get into some deep talk today on a very light level. We'll be right back. Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. about with Dale Happy Knows. What we think, we become. What we radiate, we attract. And what we imagine, we surely can achieve. Let's change the narrative two for two. So this evening, we have another special guest on our show, a gentleman by the name of Kishan Monroe. He is a deep, deep, deep young man. Don't mind the goggles and uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, locks. Um, There's plenty of thought going on in that head. And he, and he terminates it and puts it on paper and film and many other medium so that we can uh, inspire ourselves to move to higher heights. Uh, Kishan is a documentarian, a researcher, a disciplinary artist. Uh, he's also an avid explorer. Um, he also has frequently engaged in anthropological expeditions and that's where we get into this um, part of being the art. Um, anyway. So when we look at it, we also know that he has leveraged his work um, from a historical analysis, and he's done some major, major, major pieces that we're going to talk about some of them tonight. And you might know one of them in terms of our uh, Cuba and Bahamas conflict. Monroe is also a notable work for, and that work is the swan song of the flamingo that we um, know very well, as uh, comes up every year that we want to say. We also know that, that he is a man on the move. And so we would like to welcome Mr. Keyshawn Monroe to the show. Something to think about with Dale Happy knows. Welcome, 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 welcome. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for having me on. You're, you're, you're quite welcome. So when, when you in, in, uh, would have been able to do all these fancy things that you come up with um, in this art world and the art space and the like, most people think about art as just drawing little things on a piece of paper or on a mural and the like. But you become the art, at least that's what I call it. Uh, uh, you got a fancy name for it too um, in there. And so... When we look at this, um, we want to ask you that, what are the purpose of art? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, I think that art is life and life is art, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you study the history of art, if you study the history of communication, uh, you would find that uh, some of the earliest humans right? What they left behind, which is history, mm -hmm. is uh, representations of what they saw. Mm -hmm. What they did was they found things or ways to archive their environment, their experiences, whether it be hunting, whether it be just their, their way of life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so those are the things that remain from like thousands of years ago, hundreds and thousands of, of years ago, whether they are covered up uh, we sometimes unearth them and we learn even more about ourselves, mm -hmm. right? As human beings, uh, we learn a lot more about our cultures, our interactions, what we learn, what we unlearn, education, miseducation, mm -hmm. right? So for me, uh, art is life, life is art, and it's very much a spiritual thing for me. Uh, it's very much so 
a, a challenge, mm -hmm. right? One of the reasons I'm in the Bahamas right now is not because it's easy, it's because it's hard, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I've traveled extensively. Uh, I've seen what it takes to live successfully as a professional artist in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. right? And I decide to come back home because I see the beauty in coming back home. I do realize that this limestone does in fact have gold, mm -hmm. right? So some people just walk over it and call it dirt, mm -hmm. but I see it for what it is because I, I see the world through, through different lenses, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because I, I place importance, I think on, on different things. Uh, one of the best things I think that happened for me was my thesis. Uh, and what I did was I thoroughly examined myself, uh, my family members, my immediate family members, uh, basically the physical characteristics. And I tried to understand, or I tried to analyze or speculate on what in our histories caused us to generate uh, certain physical characteristics like frown lines or laugh lines, you know, mm -hmm. what about our history uh, informed me as the the artist, as the viewer of the, the photos, or mm -hmm. the documentation I was looking at, right? And so having to do that on yourself makes you just like staring into the mirror mm -hmm. so long that you almost feel like you're staring at somebody else, right? And so that actually became the methodology for my practice. My practice is all about introspection. It's about reflection, right? Mm -hmm. So I constantly stare in the mirror because every time I stare in the mirror, I ask myself uh, new questions. Mm -hmm. And I realize that I am more than just me. I am my forefathers. I am my ancestors. I have that uh, ancestral DNA. I have that memory, that history. Uh, but you just have to learn that when you look at yourself from different perspectives, you you will see uh, different persons, right? Not that you're split personality, <laughs> but you would see, uh, like for example, I'm really just now uh, so enthralled with the ocean, right? Uh, and that just happened to me later on in life, right? Uh, I grew up, of course, in the Bahamas, which is a island nation, archipelago, mm -hmm. but around the time I was about 30, it was almost like this calling, right? <laughs> and when I study uh, my lineage more, I learned that all of my family members were seamen. They lived in the ocean, they lived in the sea, they lived on boats, right? I didn't think that I had it in me like that, but it's like, you know, sometimes you have these uh, allergies mm -hmm. and these allergies don't, don't manifest themselves uh, physically until later on in life, right? And so I, I, I feel as it's kind of like the same way. Some things just happen to you later on, uh, whether it be uh, the path that you have taken or just interventions of, of some sort, or it's just, sometimes it's just meant to be. Some families have a lot of singers, some families have a lot of businessmen because mm -hmm. it's in you, right? right? It's literally in you. So that's something like the, whatever blew past the air just now and caused me to cough, right? Like it <laughs> happens in, in time and whenever it's supposed to happen before. <laughs> and so when we look at what you were just talking about, you are doing all of this on a basis that you have um, a lot of experience and you have uh, academics as a uh, bachelor's of fine arts and a uh, master's in fine arts. And you're a professor, at, at, assistant professor at the um, University of Bahamas. So you interfacing with a lot of young people. Yes. And so they, you're, you're seeing them, their images reflecting on you too. So that, you know, people always say, people that you're in contact with, you get uh, some sort of vibe from them and move forward. So tell us then, this concept calling the tie-in in history with the uh, art intervention. And I always look at art intervention as two big combo words. Uh, <laughs> break, break that down for us and, and what does that mean? Okay, so basically art intervention. So it's art designed to interact 
uh, with uh, a situation or other art or other structures, right? So I use my art more so as a catalyst uh, for activism, right? So let me give you a, a little more history on how I got more into art intervention, right? So when I was at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, one of the first jobs that I got was with the Telfair Museum of Art. And so I went in there and uh, I wasn't working inside the museum. They asked me to be an outreach artist. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like a curse. Like, you don't think I'm good enough to like work inside the gallery, inside the museum? And so what they had me do was I was working with like at risk youth, mm -hmm. uh, toddlers to like preteen ages. And these basically, uh, in the rougher parts of town, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I also had to work uh, with uh, senior citizens at like mm -hmm. old folks' homes. So I would have to spend time with them. And each time, especially with the senior citizens, mm -hmm. uh, they would speak to me. They would say, I see this in you. You know, uh, I love this about you. This is what you uh, need to do. They would give me words of wisdom, words of encouragement. This is mm -hmm. what I would do if I were your age, you know? And so it really got a different gear turn in, in my mind mm -hmm. as to the importance, uh, the significance of art and what what I should be using it to do. Because if all of these persons are coming up to me telling me right. this is what they see inside me, again, you're dealing with a uh, rough goal, right? Mm -hmm. So each comment that they gave, each word of wisdom that they gave was like refinement, helping me to discover myself. Mm -hmm. And so like I said, I work with ad use, uh, ad risk youth. And so being from the Bahamas, we take for granted that we could walk around every day. We're surrounded by Olympians, right. you know, people like Sydney Poitier. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have uh, black people who we could recognize as successful, right. you know? And so we walk around with a certain audacity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this belief that we can achieve, that we can exist on the, on the global stage at the top, right? And so when I walked into those spaces, that is what they saw, that's what they told me they saw, right? Mm -hmm. And that the, the children kind of picked up on. And so I really had to tap into art intervention once again. How do I get art? How do I use art to get these children who have thrown up gang signs, right. Right? Uh, cussing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> come and leave the class? How do I get them to the point? Well, at the end of the day, they were coming on time, speaking properly, mm -hmm. respecting one another, dressing different, speaking different, teaching mm -hmm. one another, and wanting to come to class, mm -hmm. right? All because of art. And so that actually led into me drafting or designing a project that I titled The Universal Human Experience. So all of this was happening around the time when the war in Iraq, right? right. In the Middle East was, was still fresh, mm -hmm. right? Everybody was talking about profiling, you know, racial tension, ethnic right. tensions. And so I, I drafted the Universal Human Experience and I said, okay, you know what? I'm tired watching the news, mm -hmm. you know, people telling me was biased from what's not biased. Let me right. go out and have my own experiences, mm -hmm. right? Let people respond to me and let my truth be my truth. And then I could share that with other mm -hmm. persons who could come up and make their own conclusions. Right. So that's my background to a certain degree uh, on our intervention. Mm -hmm. OK. And so now um, with that perspective, then in, in intersecting art intervention with history to uh, allow you to breathe success. Um, why why the combo um, history and art intervention? because those two seem to stand out a lot because a lot of your work, when I look at it, um, it, it's drilling a lot on what has happened in the past and what is happening. And then you want to be physically in the art. That's the way I look at it um, and so forth. Why, why that combination? What inspired that? Uh, definitely because, I mean, in order to move forward, you have to have a point to see where you're moving from, <laughs> right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, to see at least, okay, this is the progress, but if you never mark where you're coming from, you never know what your progress is. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, number two, I spoke about DNA. I spoke about knowing your ancestry to a certain degree. And so you have to study your past because you never know what's inside you. Like uh, you have to know your history when you go to the doctor. Do you have a history of diabetes? Right. 
right. have problems. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know that, you, that's something that you need to know, right? So it's the same thing with everything else. What are you good at? You know, uh, maybe you're a mathematician. Uh, you might fail every English course on earth, but you're just good with math, right? And so it, it's, I think it's important to know those those types of things. Uh, and uh, being in this region, uh, being this uh, Kong Salad, right? Mm -hmm. We have in the Caribbean or in the Bahamas where we have people from everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, so many cultures, right? Uh, and then... Uh, some ethnicities not knowing a major part of their history, not being able to trace their family tree uh, back far enough to really know who they are, right? And so again, that leads back to my thesis, me staring in the mirror, me staring at my parents, right. trying to figure out like, who are we really like, mm -hmm. like uh, we could do this uh, this DNA, you know, ancestry.com and they tell you, oh, you part Nigerian, part this, that and the next, right? But mm -hmm. How do you tap into that, right? And so on top of that, being in the Bahamas, this is the gateway to the new world. Mm -hmm. And that's something we overlook so much and uh, so significant, even though we uh, breaking up Columbus, you know, that is significant to our history. I'm not saying that we should celebrate it, but I'm saying it is significant because of what it costs in this part of the world it actually led to slavery which right. led to the industrial mm -hmm. revolution which led to all of the other revolutions and uh globalization right, right. so when you look at it the bahamas plays a very very significant uh role in in that narrative that is the history of what we know as the round earth because before it was flat right right yeah. <laughs> so we have the kind of unflatten the, the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that uh, we need to do more, especially in the Bahamas. And I didn't realize it until I went to Savannah, Georgia uh, for school. Mm -hmm. And Savannah is one of the first slave ports in America, mm -hmm. right? It's on the East Coast for those who don't know. Uh, it's a very, very structured, a very planned city. Everything is in a grid. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very well known for its architecture. People go there specifically to study architecture, town planning, etc. So transitioning from the Bahamas, where when you go downtown, you don't even have roads on streets, you're going down a two way lane that look like a, a walkway, you know, uh, that's not planned, basically, right? Well, most, of our, most of our roads were are just made as a result of that's the track road that people used to walk on and so they need yeah. to the roads right the road. yeah. yeah so making that transition from a place like that that's not planned to a place that's very much so planned and seeing their monuments seeing the historic preservation seeing the stories seeing the the way that hollywood is attracted to it for those various reasons and seeing what what it could be right uh, and then multiplying that in my head with the history that I wanted to learn so much more about because I realized that is there are so many layers to history, right? Mm -hmm. There's history that you have to unearth and then there's history that you are supposed to create, okay. right? So mm -hmm. people just look at history as a backward thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what I said half a second ago is already history. Right. So history is almost like now, mm -hmm. right? So you always have to think about creating history, creating an archive. And so that's that leads to like the path that I've actually taken uh, in my life because I realize okay every step you kind of take is is a part of this history mm -hmm. right and so you kind of have to order your steps you have to live uh, a purposeful life because nobody is really uh, guaranteed any time mm -hmm. and I think a lot of this is coming out of the fact that I had a few near-death experiences, you know, and I think some persons had this experience even coming out of the pandemic, once right. you've already gone through certain uh, traumas, right, you realize that you're only like one breath, half a breath away from not even being here, not right. being yeah. able to do certain things. So if you have something, if you have identified something that you truly believe is your purpose, then you're gonna use that time because you see it, it it's it's so fleeting, right? right? Yeah. This life. Yeah. So when we look at that then with the with the young people, you know, they all about 
getting big, becoming big. And a lot of people always say art is not the the um, the environment where you 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 get win, get rich quick kind of thing, and so forth. So how would you define what is success? Um, because you know they all want to be successful, but I don't know if they could even define what is success. Yeah, that's a good question because you uh, too often uh, see quote unquote successful people who commit suicide, right? Right, And everybody looks at them and said, but you had everything in the world, like you were so successful, like why would that person commit suicide? Mm -hmm. And then you have to realize that maybe they did not see themselves as successful. And so I look at success, so I see success as, uh, when I speak about purpose, it's me being able to move toward that purpose, right? uh to to make some progress toward that purpose my purpose not somebody else's purpose Uh, i think too often persons see uh other people who are successful right or who have the who are perceived as being successful Mm -hmm. right and they try they, they go beyond being inspired they try to mimic right the life they start talking like them walking like them you know even all of their life movements become like that oh uh because jordan did this i'm gonna i'm gonna do it too right Mm -hmm. uh but you you can't move toward your purpose like that because sometimes people stumble upon success Mm -hmm. right uh it it wasn't really planned and all we see is the success we don't really see the burden of what we perceive to be the success and so success for me is uh i'm more so about art intervention uh, being able to use my talents on my artwork, right? Not just uh, visual work, uh, not just audible work, but anything that could stimulate, right? As human beings. Mm-hmm. So, because it's, it's always changing, especially with new technology, uh, electronic media. We're speaking about the metaverse now. Like 10 years ago, we would not have dreamt that something like this probably would be happening mm-hmm. so quickly, right? And so, yeah, that, that's my definition of success, uh, being able to identify your purpose and then moving toward that sense of purpose uh, and doing it not only gradually, but, but doing it, for me, more so intentionally. Intentionally, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and without without being distracted by what what others mm-hmm. tell me is success or what the, what the rest of the world see as success because everybody wants money. Like you said, I wanted money. I wanted the bling. I wanted my name to be mm-hmm. uh, a big signature on everything. And then I stopped signing my work, right? Mm-hmm. At least on the front, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. There was a period I stopped signing it completely then. Uh, I stopped signing it on the front because authorship, there was, it was a different conversation in the art world, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's like everybody, it, artists change when, when you speak about maturity, right? And it all depends on why you're in the game. Not everybody is going to be in the game for the same purpose as me, right. and they shouldn't be, as they wouldn't be living probably their purpose. Somebody's purpose is to be a commercial artist, right? right? Mm-hmm. So, and then somebody's purpose is to be the opposite of a commercial artist. Mm-hmm. So you just have to find the thing uh, that works for you. And sometimes you might not think it works for you, but it is something that people respond to. So it might seem like a burden to you, but it's the thing that the world needs. So it's a, it's a tricky kind of topic to uh, to feel out. Yeah. So what we're going to do now, um, we're going to take a break. And we're going to be back in a couple of seconds. So we're here with Kishan Monroe. Um, this is the uh, Happy Nose and something to think about. And we're talking about his art intervention and crossing it, intersecting it with history and being able to become successful. And when we come back, we will talk a little bit about some of his successes. <laughs>
Sammy's Chicken. There's nothing like it. Sometimes it's hard to find a company that can get the job done right. At Mission Complete, we do just that. Mission Complete offers a wide variety of services from janitorial to sanitation to pressure washing pool decks and patios. We're also proud to offer COVID-19 decontamination for your home or business. And for those multi-legged critters, we call in our pest control and rodent team. Why call four different companies when you can call just one and get the job done? Call us now and let's get this mission started. Something to think about with Dale Happy Nose. We're here with Keishan Monroe, and we're talking about um, art intervention um, intersecting with history and how it became his journey, his enabler to breed success. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about success and what it means to him and so forth. And so, Keishan, as we uh, close that portion out, um, I wanted to just ask for you in terms of what it is that actually tells you that you're being successful, other than the fact that you have a goal and you say, okay, I want to be able to reach down to Chicken Unlimited by 20 or Sammy's Chicken by <laughs> 10 o'clock tomorrow. I mean, that's a set goal. But what, what are the signs that come to you? that tells you as an individual that you're doing your purpose and you are fulfilling your goal. Is it a feeling? Is it something? What, what tells you that? I think that man is uh, a communal creature, right? So we can't uh, live like eagles, right? Some people can, of course, but in general, we are very communal. And so I feel as though each person is put in a specific place right at specific times for specific reasons mm -hmm. and each of us has something to contribute and our goal is so it's like a treasure hunt right in life and your talent may be hidden some person's talents are hidden a lot deeper than others right okay. so your goal in life is to find that talent wherever it is it might be on the surface or it might be buried and so your path or your journey to finding that talent or unearthing that talent is uh, a, a part of what I see as success, right? And uh, yeah, so I, I, everything that I do is, is kind of driven by motivation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because even through my travels, I think we might talk about it. Uh, when I I graduated from university. I told you I planned a, what was really a global expedition. Uh, I focused more so on the Americas, uh, where I backpacked throughout the Americas by myself for almost two years, right? And so being by myself, having to communicate in areas where I did not speak the language, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so basically having to adapt, right, is what I had to do. And I did that very intentionally to force myself to have to learn uh, sign language to a certain degree, right? Have mm -hmm. to learn Spanish, uh, the variations of Spanish, right? The dialects, the slangs, right? To have to be even English, 
you'd be surprised. You're speaking the same language, but you're not speaking the same language, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's so, so much that is miscommunicated and misunderstood uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I, I found myself just focusing on uh, listening to people, mm -hmm. right? Communication, I think, is key. And uh, mentorship is key. And when we speak about mentorship, we, we or wisdom or learning from other people, we usually think about all the persons. But I feel as though you could learn something from every mm -hmm. single individual like you. I don't care if it's a toddler or a newborn baby, you could always learn something. And it's not necessarily what is presented to you, it's the way that you look at it, right? Or the way that you don't look at it. Sometimes you just need to close your eyes to really see things, right? And so, uh, yeah, I, I just feel as though communication is, is very important. I think that mentorship is very important. And uh, I don't want to stray too much off your- no, no, That's yeah. fine, yeah. Okay. So folks you out there, you're welcome to ask your questions online. Um, um, we'll ask them to our guest here today, Kishan. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to address them all. And we um, welcome you all again. Um, I think I saw Mrs. Hannah um, pop up earlier uh, and uh, one or two other persons that I, my little short head can't remember right now, but I'm sure they'll come back in my mind and I'll make note at you. So Helen um, Barton Hannah is saying, what is the biggest misconception about the history culture and how has your perception changed since you began exploring this intersection? Uh, the biggest misconception culture in general or our culture or um well i guess the culture what you're exposed to i mean that's the only one you could really speak to it eh? um, well i i would say the biggest misconception is that the world is darker than it is light by that i mean that there is much more danger and that uh people are more more negative than they are positive especially if you keep watching the news right especially if you keep uh, watching the videos on WhatsApp. Uh, based on my encounters, when I travel, there are more persons willing to help you mm -hmm. than to take advantage of you, right? And uh, I think that we, we get too caught up on material things. Uh, we get too caught up on commercial things. Uh, we get too caught up on money, right? And uh, we because we're so caught up on money, we think that persons who have less or per impoverished persons are automatically depressed, mm -hmm. right. right? Financially, spiritually depressed, emotionally depressed. Uh, one of the things that I learned is, is kind of the opposite. The places, mm -hmm. the most impoverished places, uh, I've seen some of the most happy people, right? Unless it's mm -hmm. extreme poverty, right? right. right? Uh, but that's that's what I've seen because they tend to place more emphasis on quality of life rather than the quantity of what they have, whether it be forced or unforced, right? Uh, and so I, I think that it happens to all of us. Uh, I see it when, when it happens to us here in the Bahamas after hurricanes, thank God for life, mm -hmm. right? But two days before that, we we complaining about everything. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, BPL, yeah. can I keep the electricity on? They burn up my toaster, and everything else. Yeah. But you let a hurricane pass, you just thank God for life, mm -hmm. right? Thank God for this bottle of water, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest misconception uh, is very purpose, purposefully uh, put out there uh, for propagandistic reasons because mm -hmm. it draws in money it draws in likes, which is influence, which is still money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because we, for some reason, we uh, we gravitate toward it, right? right? right. We've, we've come to use to that. Yeah, so Ms. Anna is asking here, and he said, how important is social uh, commentary and the history of a uh, nation? And I want to add to that before you go into that. Um, part of that programming to me is coming from the fact that we watch too much TV. And mm -hmm. So let, let's tackle Mrs. Hannah's uh, comment here. Okay, how important is social commentary? Yeah, art and social commentary and the history of our nation. Art, art commentary? Yeah. And the history of our nation. Yeah. Can I see them on the screen? 
No, no I can't say. It's extremely important, especially in the Bahamas, because we have no photo. We have very little photographs, right? Oh. We don't have a very uh, deep or very extensive art history. Uh, only in the 1950s or 60s did we see artists emerging in the Bahamas as professional artists or you know full-time artists, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We had traveling artists, famous artists who came to the Bahamas and uh, rendered right. you know, scenes of what they saw of our culture, but we did not have any quote unquote Bahamians like who lived here, who uh, I shouldn't say we didn't have any, but it, it, it was not very known right or very popular uh at the time i'm sure we have persons who did uh engage in those types of practices uh but it's extremely important we need to be able to see you know we need to be able to see what pompey looked like if we didn't know what he looked like what did he do right because it's still a language it's a visual language too a, a lot of our history is very oral mm -hmm. right we sing in these songs and then we lose the meaning of the songs right? Because it's our dialect. It might even be a different language. A hundred years later, we still sing it. We're still using the language, but what does it mean? Yeah. Who is able to even translate it anymore? It just becomes a practice instead of a way to archive our culture. And so it's the same thing with our visual culture. Only thing, uh, your brain and your eyes kind of develop together. Your brain, your eyes, and your heart, right? Okay. So before you have vision you you, this guy deep. You know, yeah. <laughs> before you have vision you actually have a heartbeat mm -hmm. right so when you go down and you hear john canoe on bay street and they start up knocking them drums mm -hmm. you could tap into that when you hear the, them reggae beats you know those culture beats right. it literally tapping into your heartbeat so some people wonder why am i why do i feel so in tune with this because it's literally how you became a part of it this is what you know it it was you before you were you, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with art. We, we, uh, even the language is the same. Rhythm, you could see rhythm, you could hear rhythm, right? Uh, so certain words, certain terminologies actually uh, are shared uh, for the very same reason. It's like when you taste something and something smells bad, no matter how good it tastes, it'll start to taste bad to you, right? Because of the way it's, it, it smells, because all of those things are linked. And it's the same thing with your vision. So uh, it, long story short, it's extremely important because we need to, to be able to remember and like mm -hmm. billboards, you see billboards for seconds, fractions mm -hmm. of a seconds for that same reason, because mm -hmm. immediately you could process it, right. right? And you remember it. Yeah. Well, with me, you know, if, if it smelled bad, it ain't getting in my, <laughs> my mouth. No, 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 the food, no, the, no, no. What is the, there is a song about that two piece of chicken and all that yeah like, oh um rapper's delight i think it was just a song mm -hmm. piece in it too yeah so recently we just celebrated majority rule right and majority rule was about access a political on a political environment and so forth and we also know that the sydney is um probably one of our most prominent if not the most prominent um artists that we had um did a lot to transform and and knock down barriers and the like and, and and so forth so that was what i call doing the majority rule number one era so we now need to move into majority rule number two to take the country to another level and um so forth and so when we look at that we say how do we or how or what would we say art does in terms of helping us to enable the majority rule 2.0 and I saw Chantel um, Bethel's um, post just now, and she is one, another artist who has, uh, what you call it, thought-provoking type of art, like you. Yeah. Okay, so how do visual arts help uh, with the next step? Yeah, to, to get to this, this point where we can become economically level and also to continue this movement of emancipating the mind so that we, could, we all have access. Because right now, I believe we, put, we hold ourselves back the more than anybody else. You said we have this perception that the world is darker than it is light. Um, but when you travel, you see a lot of things or misconceptions. You don't see it 
because you, you, you see what the people are doing, which is different than what maybe was happening here on a day-to-day -day basis. People look at you, you got locks on, walking on the street, and they just dismiss you. But when you're away, they don't. Um, at least that was my experience. Uh, I don't have locks, but I mean, <laughs> and that's on top of my head now. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting question. It's a very important question because sometimes we get so close to things that we tend not to see what it truly is, mm -hmm. right? So some people would argue that we we need more Renaissance men, more Renaissance mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you that we have Renaissance men, we have Renaissance women. Mm -hmm. we, we have examples of black persons who are at the top of their game globally, mm -hmm. right? So let's, okay, so let's pay uh, attention to what we have right uh even when you look at somebody like rihanna rihanna started off in what music then mm -hmm. she branched off into entrepreneurship now she's being celebrated in our country she's being celebrated worldwide right let's look at jay-z uh puff daddy uh, all of these other persons they started off in music they went off into film they went off into uh having their own product lines their own mm -hmm. franchises so just as the definitions or the, the the disciplines of art uh because art has no rules right if i want to use the stock market as my canvas okay uh then that's what it is mm -hmm. i could have an exhibition on the stock market why because i say so right. but my job as the artist is to convince you or help you to see it and if i'm a good enough artist you will see it Right? right because the mind even if something does not exist your mind will tell you that it's dead that's how you hallucinate and stuff right, right. Mm -hmm. so you will see things because your brain is processing with your eyes taking in mm -hmm. right so yeah i think that we we have what it takes i think that sometimes we need to ease off of the criticism and start being more thankful if we start looking around and saying okay i'm thankful for this thankful for that maybe we'll see it for what it actually is instead mm -hmm. of complaining oh we need more of this if you keep saying we need more of we don't have you will never see it right right, right? Mm -hmm. and so uh like i said we we have examples sydney poitier mm -hmm. you know he died and it's, it's funny when you die or when these people die all of a sudden the sales go up he was celebrated before but mm -hmm. it is more emphasis placed on the significance of their life right, right? Mm -hmm. and it should be uh, but I'm just saying it's interesting that it spikes at that point in time. So we have persons within the Bahamas. I think they just need the right light cast on them. They need opportunities. And I thank you for this opportunity uh, because we, we need more positive people uh, to engage in this type of dialogue. So I could have the best speech. I could be uh, the most articulate person in the world. But if I don't have anybody to speak to, uh, to engage uh, with them, I'm lost. And like I said before, man is a communal creature, mm -hmm. right? So we, my conversation with you, I'm learning from this conversation. I'm learning from the comments and the questions that I'm getting right now. I'd be a fool if I wasn't, right? right. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's how I approach life. That's how I approach my practice, especially as an educator, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being motivated, right? Uh, knowing that is within you, you have it within you to, to change the situations. Uh, to change at least your world right right mm -hmm. and i think we need more of that especially in our society uh immediate Bahamian society when we look at the types of uh crimes we have going on right uh mm -hmm. is it's that in itself is a is a different type of discipline uh is a different type of muscle that needs to be woken up and uh built so to speak yeah you need to you need to exercise that a whole lot more mm -hmm. but the arts in the bahamas we need persons in spheres of influence mm -hmm. uh to show people that like i just said art when you think of art traditionally art far exceeds those definitions right and so uh art is very much important to our progression mm -hmm. as a society uh even when every political political season you see these photographs and oh, these yeah. politicians look so you know flawless you know and they glow in like angels in fact that's how art was actually used as propaganda in the early church 
I saw oil painting became popular, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When you look at these, these traditional churches, you see everything is gold and glistening and you have the stained glass windows because it, it was uh, tapping into the emotions of the congregation mm -hmm. to make it's like a ceremony. It's a performance. It was theater. Okay. So we have a certain section of the church built a certain way so that the, the music mm -hmm. would travel uh, at the most effective way. Right, because you did not have an amplifier back in 15th, right. 14th century, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You did not have lights. So you had stained glass windows and as a reason is facing a certain uh, direction, you know, the smoke and all the rest of these things. So, so a lot of these things uh, tap into the, the human consciousness uh, and how we feel. Because uh, even people say, well, I guess being in the church, I feel so much better, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so uh, just studying, uh, these uh, various responses to, to environment over the years. Uh, I pay more attention to these little things. Uh, and uh, I, I'm always glad when I have the opportunity to sit down with persons who get it. A few years ago, I had the opportunity uh, to interact, uh, to, to work with uh, who's then the president of the Senate, uh, uh, Sharon Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, the persons who were in power at that time, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, Miss Maynard Gibson as well. So they were very instrumental in having me carry uh, my flamingo, uh, my exhibition that was based on the sinking of HMBS flamingo over into the Senate building for the first time in history. I personally took down uh, these huge portraits mm -hmm. of these Europeans, these European monarchs. I personally took them off the walls. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've ever been off the walls because the walls behind them were still, it looked like the original walls almost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I took them down almost ceremoniously and I was able to replace them with my own paintings mm -hmm. of individuals who look like me and you Right. individuals who I actually spoke to, I mm -hmm. got their stories. They trusted me with their stories. Right. And now I had the opportunity to say, this is a part of our narrative. This is a part of the contemporary or the modern Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Commonwealth, Commonwealth right. of the Bahamas. And so for me, this is a part of my purpose. This I think is in harmony with where I need to go. And I, I find joy in being able to do that because it's not only for me, because those men, the survivors, and even those who didn't survive by way of their family members, right. were able to see, okay, so many years later, uh, but these people, they got it, right? They got it to a certain degree, uh, enough to celebrate it in this way. Politics aside, it didn't have to be done at all, right? right. right? So I, as long story short, it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have an opportunity to do it as artists, I think that we definitely should, you know, use it as leverage for the greater good of society. Right, right. So, Madam Producer, you want to put up those um, pictures of some of his work so um, Kishan could walk us through some of these things as we um, go down the road? Because when, when we look at our whole society, we, we very much still colonial mindset in a lot of ways and we need to remove the shackles and so a lot of this work that you're doing um, to me does that and um, somehow we have to find ways where we are a very creative country and particularly on the youth and we have to find ways in order to get them more engaged um, in a structural way so that they could live themselves become them they could do it so this particular one, um, you're starting here, this is when you were on which ship? Uh, in 2019, I actually had the opportunity to be artist in residence aboard Schmidt Ocean Institutes. It's a ocean science institute, and they work with some of the top ocean and space institutions and organizations around the world. Uh, it was founded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric Schmidt is the former CEO of Google. And uh, Wendy Schmidt, uh, both of them are business persons, mm -hmm. right? And so I was able to be a part of their expedition uh, 
in the Pacific Northwest, and we were engaged in echo mapping uh, the sea floor. So we were, well, they basically were doing it. I learned how the, uh, the instruments work, uh, but they were discovering uh, sea mounts or uh, mountains under the surface of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so if you pay attention to a globe or if you go to uh, Google Earth, you would see in the ocean uh, a, a lot of flat surfaces. It's not necessarily flat because the ocean is flat. It's flat. It's so flat because it's, it hasn't been mapped. Uh, they say they know a lot more about space than they know about the ocean. <laughs> Right, and so uh, there is an initiative to map uh, the the seafloor uh, as close to the entire seafloor as possible. I think by twenty thirty. Yeah, and so that's uh, I'm in the control room of okay. RV Falcor, the research vessel Falcor. Wow, you billion million dollar company, and that's you in in, in the middle. Yeah, I'm so saying. so I went from a. Uh, million multi-million dollar boat to uh, <laughs> a wooden canoe in haiti and i like this shot because when you think about haiti people always tell you about the dust and the dirt and the deforestation yeah, mm. they very seldom mention water right right so uh i had the opportunity to visit one of the fishing villages right and uh so i took the opportunity to document uh, that part of their culture and so this is something that I do everywhere that I go. I document the culture, I document the environment, I speak to uh, the persons who live in that environment and uh, try to get a better understanding of their situations. Mm -hmm. um, it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. It has so much motion in it, so much. Every time you look at it, I see something different. Yeah, this is one of the, the large format paintings that I created. Uh, based on my research on the sinking of HMBS Flamingo. So mm -hmm. I actually created an entire exhibition that actually was a, a, a national exhibition mm -hmm. at the time in 2013. So this particular piece uh, is more of a comprehensive narrative uh, that gives you elements of the series of events in one frame, so to speak. Uh, so I captured the man in the water struggling, uh, trying to survive or trying to float or even trying to get away or even dive right. from the MiG jets, the uh, supersonic fighter jets from Cuba that were shooting at them in the water. In the background, you can see HMBS Flamingo shot up, right. smoking and getting ready to sink. Right. And, and so this, this is when I actually started using red, my color palette changed to reds and blues. Mm -hmm. No, I was gonna say, and this was the event itself um, happened shortly after um, our defense force wasn't even, uh, what should you call it? You still had milk around the mouth, eh? No, yeah, it's very, very much in its uh, infancy. Mm -hmm. So HMBS Flamingo was one of the first patrol uh, ships, or uh, patrol boats of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, we just had the police, you know, the police had boats on the water. Yeah. So they actually brought Flamingo and a few other boats over from London. Right, they sailed them, they ain't even sailed them uh, yeah. here to the Bahamas. And so this is basically our Pearl Harbor that had not been spoken about. Uh, I feel uh, the way that it should have been, mm -hmm. uh, it, it needed to be more thoroughly examined, I would say. Okay. So because it was spoken about every year, they have a ceremony, but I think uh, it, it needed visualization, mm -hmm. right? It needed uh, constructive criticism. It needed an investigation. Right. Cool. And this is the picture when it was in, uh, what I said, the police place. Yeah, this is a uh, Carl Harbor base. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Defense Force base in Carl Harbor. Wow. And so the, 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 I call it not what you call it, not the king, queen, con queen, queen conch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, if we see that today, that that is especially when the Christmas when you all had all the lights on it and stuff like that. That I mean that was supernatural. And yeah, I like they put the lights on it. I wasn't responsible for the lights, but oh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But uh, 
I was commissioned by the Public Beaches and Public Park Parks Authority mm -hmm. to restore uh, these metal sculptures that were created by the late Stephen uh, Burroughs. And so, of course, this is right up my alley because it helped me to tackle a bit of Bahamian history. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel as though Stephen Burroughs was a very unsung hero. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was iconic, right? And I felt that his artwork needed to be respected. I, I felt that it was important for me to make my restoration visible once again, because mm -hmm. art and visualizing art and history isn't just the artifact or the product, is actually the journey. It's the performance of it, right? It's mm -hmm. the motion of it, right? And for some people, that is even more meaningful because I have so many persons who stopped even on the roundabouts uh, with children, mm -hmm. right? And say how the roundabouts actually became conversation pieces and they began to share bits and pieces of history, you know, with their mm -hmm. children, right? So each time that they pass or rotated, some persons would ride round and round the, <laughs> and round the road <laughs> just to watch, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad uh, they had that opportunity to do it because that's exactly what I did when I was small, right? Sometimes we would ride round and around. So to be able to, to have uh, the youths of today have a, a very similar experience, you know, uh, and for me to be able to make my contribution uh, through uh, making sure that these structures survive a little longer. And then as a more visual artist, as a painter, because Boros was more of a sculptor, right? right? Not more of a painter, right? So uh, I just wanted to, to put my hand to it. Something I always wanted to do actually. Mm -hmm. So when I had the opportunity, I, I jumped at it. Because uh, I really felt as though it, it it takes a specific mindset to do certain things. But they came to life once you touched them. That's the way. You Thank you. To me, to, to me, that's the way. I, I mean, I had tourists and and like you say, Bahamians and the like when they they when people talk about these, they talk about them in a very positive light, and they we identify with these um, structures. Um, around on the multiple roundabouts and so forth, and, um, and more so than actually some of the forefathers and the rest of, of the country, because a lot of their busts and statues are very small or push in the corner, and so this is what people see. And I think this is speaking to what Mrs. Hannah was asking in terms of how, how this whole creative picture paints or uh, affects our way forward. Yeah. <clears throat> Like I said, I, I it was, I mean, everything I do, I, I tend to gravitate towards uh, work that is challenging, right? Things that I could physically step into. So obviously these are larger than myself, right? Uh, so yeah, it was just uh, stimulating to me to to be able to see them come back to life, right? And not only that, but to see people commenting on it, right? more favorably now this was a part of a movie or i mean a documentary right um as i watched this at the national art gallery if i remember right uh this i don't think this was at the national art gallery but this well it is a part of uh documentation uh my documentation so that's actually me on a raft that i constructed mm -hmm. uh so i Okay, so after my Flamingo project, I traveled to Russia several mm -hmm. times to do a little bit more research on socialism and communism and its connection to the Caribbean, right? So while I was over there, I, I studied Russian constructivism uh, a little bit more. So Russian constructivism uh, focuses more on kind of like building things more, mm -hmm. like constructing things as opposed mm -hmm. to just creating fine art like from like industrial materials, right? And so I, I, I grew more interested in those kind of things. And so when I came back home, I was invited to be a part of a, another show by a Russian museum, uh, which asked me to respond to uh, how do I maintain a sense of home uh, as a professional artist, even when traveling to various parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, for residencies. And I thought about it and I realized 
uh, I felt as though as a member of the of this diaspora in the Caribbean, right, or in this part of the world, uh, we 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 still trying to figure out what it is to be a Bahamian, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have been drifting. Uh, some persons drift in physically, literally, mm -hmm. and but in terms of our place, uh, self of placement, sense of placement, we've been drifting, right? Drifting, trying to find identity, trying to find safety in various ways. And so I said, well, just like we do with our soups, our delicacies, uh, we use the drops and we turn it into fine cuisine, right? Things mm -hmm. that can be celebrated. So I did the same thing with the materials. I use repurposed materials mostly to create a raft uh, that was inspired by the Contiki. Uh, the Contiki is a raft, a Polynesian raft that was a very renowned project uh, back in the day, uh, the space shuttle and the Bahamian sloops, as well as uh, rafts that you uh, would see from migrants or immigrants uh, moving throughout the Caribbean, drifting most of the time north for a better way of life. So I kind of merged or I fused all of those uh, things that informed uh, my opinion on mm -hmm. us as persons in this region. And I built a raft uh, and it had to be a raft that I could literally float on, mm -hmm. right? So in a nutshell, I'm using the raft as uh, just like how I was on the multi-million dollar right. But it's it's my self constructed research vessel. Ooh. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell. Yeah. So this one is is uh, that's a flamingo from. Yeah. yeah. So this was a, a sculpture that I created in Dubai last year. Uh, it was about I think maybe four or five of us who went over when the Expo twenty twenty first started. So I was artist in residence and as resident artist over there for about a month and a half. And I responded to uh, the theme of sustainability. Uh, so the Bahamas Pavilion is located in the sustainability sector uh, district. And so uh, I used the flamingo as a metaphor once again uh, for sovereignty, right? But at the same time, the flamingo was an endangered species in the Bahamas. Uh, and I use it to speak to the the fauna, you know, the flora and the fauna of the Bahamas. Uh, it more more often you see, especially on social media, you see sea life uh, caught up in plastic, mm -hmm. right? Fishing line, garbage, etc. The same thing happens to birds. Uh, you see them uh, really being described in oil spills, etc. Pollution, basically. And so I use the golden flamingo because. Uh, Dubai is a place known for its riches, right? And I wanted uh, the persons in Dubai, uh, international persons, to see the golden flamingo and how it was being held back. So the golden flamingo actually represents uh, not only gold as a physical resource, right? A resource from the earth, but it also is a metaphor for a human resource, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are being affected by these existential threats these category five hurricanes, mm -hmm. these 20 to 30 foot sea surges, right? That's our goal that we are losing on top of our landscape. We're right. losing mm -hmm. people. Uh, we are being threatened every day. Mm -hmm. And so I created two of these. Uh, one uh, is kind of flying up, but you can see is kind of being pulled back. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't see it too well because it's dark, but they are being held back by ropes. Right. And at the end of the rope, there's a blue tarpaulin. Mm -hmm. So tarp, tarpaulin or tarp is something we, we see again very often in, in this part of the world, especially after hurricane or major right. storms, people covering up their roofs, uh, etc. And so I kind of literally tied them together mm -hmm. uh, to make a statement. And uh, there was a screen that was there that I had to work around and it showed the pristine waters of the, the Bahamas, mm -hmm. right? And so once again, we're in Dubai, uh, I felt it was my duty to kind of make the connection. Okay, you like this water, you like this blue, uh, but let me help you wrap your mind around this other aspect of the reality uh, that is 
the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. Oh my, you, you, you're going to Darwin Inferno. <laughs> yeah, this was during uh, the last election uh, in, in the US. Uh, this was <laughs> right, at, this was uh, right outside the White House. <laughs> mm-hmm. So of course, you know, COVID was up in the air to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then tensions were so high, uh, propaganda. It was just a lot to deal with all around. Protection, especially mm-hmm. persons, uh, I would say minorities felt very threatened mm-hmm. uh, for very good reasons. Uh, and so once again, it, it was always a part of my explorations on my investigations as an artist. A lot of people think that my universal human experience project ended. It didn't end. It's just that through me interacting with persons, mm. persons uh, wiser than myself, e- explaining what I was trying to accomplish, they told me, okay, this is a, a, a better methodology uh, mm. to do this. You know, right. so the flamingo will be a case study for a, a certain aspect of the universal human experience, right? Mm-hmm. So I could tie oceanography, all of these other things that I have been doing into the universal human experience, and so that's just me uh, documenting uh, conflict, mm-hmm. right? Socio-political conflict, and not only conflict, but the battling. Uh, other humans, you're also battling a virus, right? You're battling mm-hmm. so many things. Yeah, so folks, um, if you didn't get the chance to do, do go on either the Facebook page or, or the um, the um, YouTube page and look at Kishan's bio um, because I really did a, a, what you call a swipe at it because it's really in depth. And if you look at some of the things that he talked about there, then we won't, if we were to cover everything that he has done, um, we would be here until tomorrow kind of thing. Um, that's, that's, that's what I see there. And so here is my mama saying that um, Kishan is so much more than an artist. Thank you for sharing uh, your outlook with us. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, um, and then Ms. Ms. Hannah, Bam, Bam, Bam Hannah again is saying quite a fascinating body of work. Uh, mad respect for your passion and humanity, humanity and our planet. So, a lot of things you have accomplished um, from your perspective and the life. Um, how well do people in society accept your work and how or what is the way forward for you and how do you use it to inspire the youth? Uh, well, my goal is to keep moving, right? Not resting on any any laurels. Mm-hmm. Uh, persons, well, I mean, you are showing me respect right now by even in, engaging in this dialogue, and then you would introduce me to a different audience. And mm-hmm. each person, like you just read a few comments that uh, were words of encouragement to me, right? So that is what we need. You know, that's what I need. Because <laughs> sometimes you really feel down and persons feel as though uh, he is strong, he could take it. Yeah, you could take it, but sometimes, you know, uh, that, that extra little word uh, really makes a difference. But I feel as though uh, I can make a, a lot more difference. Sometimes it, it's just a matter of time. Like like we said, we spoke about Sir Sidney. Uh, he did not read, et cetera, and look where he was able to literally go Mm -hmm. and what he was able to accomplish Mm -hmm. and so uh, i don't think it's i think like i said mentorship is very important uh community is very important Mm -hmm. uh spirituality i I also feel is extremely important because those things help you to identify or figure out a sense of purpose and that's one of the things that man actually needs love a sense of purpose etc And so uh, if you're trying to live a a more holistic Mm -hmm. uh, life, you have to, first of all, know the ingredients of generally what Mm -hmm. what comprises a holistic life. Mm -hmm. And so my my goal is to continue, you know, to try and use my my time as wisely as possible. And I hope that persons, 
along my path uh, would, would be able to assist me in, in these ventures. I, I think that's what we need, you know, instead of bringing one another down when we see somebody trying to accomplish it, uh, certain things we need to uh, assist in various ways and not just assist because you could write your name all over it, right? Uh, because it brings you publicity. Some, some things I've done, you would never know I, I did uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of persons did things for me and you'd never know they did it for me, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's that mindset. I, I wasn't born with it, you know, that's, that's what I learned from right. these other persons and directly and indirectly they mentored me you know this this is a way of life right this this is how you contribute right and uh these things strike a chord within you if you have any sense right and you learn and you say okay if this did this for me uh that act did this for me as an individual uh maybe i i can have this profound influence on someone or uh, many other persons right so that's one of the things i try uh to to do in my with my professorship right mm -hmm. to 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 teach uh not only methodology not only skill but how to keep yourself inspired and how to activate or motivate at the mm -hmm. same time uh, because that that is what leads to education yeah, and so when when um when um my cousin John came home and he had the nose ringing and and whatever else and then his work was so elaborately different and so forth. And now you have persons like yourself, and I'm sure there was others along the way. If I call all the names, we'll be here again for a long period of time. But in the art world, there's always this evolution and changing of what people perceive or conceive as being art. And now you have Dominic, my son, who's doing even something again to a slightly different uh, arena. How do we use these things to encourage youth out there who might be like me, who can't draw, but have some creative flair to them? How do we help them understand how to draw that out of themselves so that they could use that for their benefit? Uh. Well, conversation, first of all, like conversation, mentorship, you, we, we have to make ourselves accessible to a certain degree. Uh, even though we virtual, like you still have to reach out, you know, uh, especially as you get closer to midlife or, <laughs> you know, uh, to that, that point of maturity where you have already gained so much uh, knowledge, right? right? So much skill. You realize that if I keep, it's like eating, you eat, you eat, you eat, you get full and you could eat a little bit more. But at mm -hmm. some point in time, the more you eat, you're going to actually make yourself sick. sick right. So trying to retain so much, even though it's good, it could actually be bad for you. It could kill you. Mm -hmm. So you realize, okay, I got to get some of this stuff out. I have to share some of this stuff. Right. And so it's the same thing with knowledge. So knowledge isn't only for you, right? Like I said, you, you are given knowledge or allowed to have access to knowledge or inspiration to be able to share it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is my belief, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to, to you are the, it's being channeled through you, so to speak, right? And so that kind of goes to authorship, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's just the way that I see it, it is very important uh, to have that communication and to keep up with the times because right now art is kind of like creating digital art, mm -hmm. right? Uh, creating apps. Uh, so even parents who went to school for fine art, painting, et cetera, they might not even know what an app is or how to create an app, right? So you might have younger persons, just like video games, creating stuff uh, by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but it's that community uh, that they might actually generate that would be like a think tank, right? But if you have, for example, I might not know how to create an app, but I have access to funding or somebody who could assist them with getting devices that they need to uh, facilitate them in their creation, then that's one way uh, that could could really contribute, right, to to what uh, you're speaking of with, with the youth. And so now as more art is becoming digitized and virtual because of the lack of physical interaction, mm -hmm. right? 
you, you almost need a device to make certain things happen or to share what it is that you have created. Uh, so I think that's one way now looking at uh, what's going on presently that could definitely make a difference. And I say that uh, based on my experience at the university once again, right. you know, uh, working virtually. Uh, so you, you need these devices. Awesome. So I know one of last question and then I'll, I'll let you um, comment as to what you, I always ask my guests to say what they would like to say to the general public. But the last question is in relation to uh, people in the 242. Um, like I said, people might, my, my, like myself might not be able to draw or paint. I could take plenty of pictures, yes. Um, people say my pictures are good, but um, how, do, how do we participate in this? We feel connected to the art world, but we might not be artists ourselves per se. So how, how, what is needed, what from your perspective is needed to help a person be able to participate I'm sure there's a number of things that happen in the background that people can assist with or on the like. What's your comments on that? Well, uh, I mean, the most popular form for artists would be patronage. <laughs> Start buying some of the work. That always helps, right? Uh, buying the work, uh, we, we have a lack of uh, constructive criticism. So okay. if, if you are a person who is good with literature, you write pretty well. Uh, is good to start writing about the work, you know, because mm -hmm. that is needed. Uh, artists need that. They need that critical review, right, of their work uh, for professional purposes and, and for the dissemination of information, right? And so that leads to uh, publications, right? So if you could help uh, the artists really publicize their work, because that that could also equate to, to money. Uh, if you could give me a certain... Uh, piece of real estate on a billboard, so to speak, right? right? Uh, I don't need to go and make the money to, to pay for it because it's in kind, right? right? And so all of these contributions help uh, even lobbying for the arts. You don't have to spend a penny, but if you know persons from a specific uh, network or mm -hmm. sector of society who are interested, they might not necessarily be interested in the arts. They might not know anything about the fine arts, right. but you know that you do have influence, right? Uh, so you are persons who have, and then you are persons who don't have. Mm -hmm. So you make the connection, right? So that that is always good for the community. It doesn't always have to be money. Uh, a lot of artists need spaces to create. Uh, artists need materials. Artists need exposure to other artists, artists need mentors, uh, not only locally, but internationally. Artists also need education. So uh, scholarships, uh, sponsorships, you know, in order to continue the regional and the international dialogue uh, to help these artists expand their minds and expand their creativity, right? Uh, so there, there are various ways, even transportation, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> So, it, it, because, they're, they're, yeah, food, uh, insurance, all of these things that uh, everybody needs but overlooks because you're speaking about art specifically. And I'm just speaking about the visual arts. You have musicians, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to speak too, too tightly about art because it's so broad of a topic. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, those are the things uh, that I think artists need, but respect. Right. Definitely they need respect. Uh, you know, don't, a lot of times artists uh, ask for contributions, right? Uh, let's say auctions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but not all of the time these artists, they can give to the auctions, etc. But sometimes, you know, these artists are struggling to survive themselves. Right. And so we have to think about the reality of art, the practice or the profession of art in the Bahamas, especially during this time of the pandemic, where I mean, a lot of persons just lost uh, the stability, even uh, in a nine to five. Right. Mm -hmm. right? So we, we have to be innovative with our approaches and we have to realize that 
art intervention is much more sought after, or creativity is even more sought after now in uh, corporate worlds, right? right? Because automation is taking over uh, the corporate, well, the workplace, mm -hmm. right? Pers and persons even quitting their jobs. So we have more machines doing the, the jobs of persons. So in the future, well, not in the future, right now, you know, we, we're going to need persons who have a better uh, creative uh, grasp. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Well, I, I know I said that was the last question. I had, <laughs> I had questions come up while she was talking, but I won't ask those because then, then they might ask more questions again. But um, so what would you like to see happen in, in uh, our world? In, the art world here in the Bahamas, and what would you like to say to the public, uh, government, or whoever out there who feels something in your heart that you want to say to them? Uh, I'd like to say, well, it's tough to say because everything has been so down uh, and so isolated in these last two years because of the pandemic. But I, I think we could always use a little, a little more respect in the, the arts. Uh, a little bit more acknowledgement. I think that uh, when it comes to the representation of art uh, nationally, I think that uh, we should uh, pay careful attention uh, to, it, it should be inclusive, mm. right? Uh, I think that we, we need to see the Bahamas for what it is, for very, talented nation with a lot of thriving artists. Uh, we don't always know the persons who are creating uh, significant work, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I think we need to keep in tune with what is happening. Uh, I, Like I said before, I'd like to see the economy pick up. We're speaking about the blue and orange economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to see more action behind the, the speech, okay. so to speak. Uh, I want to see more spaces, uh, uh, more free spaces or safe spaces, so to speak, uh, that aren't really, how to say this? And like green spaces or? And that too, but spaces that uh, persons from general walks of life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it needs to be inclusive spaces, spaces where persons free, feel free and feel comfortable. They don't feel threatened in any right. way right. to come. Uh, and I feel as though uh, we need more spaces like that. And when persons feel more comfortable, then they tend to gravitate towards those spaces, okay. right? Yes. Yeah, and so, uh, Generally, I, I feel that we are an extremely creative, extremely resourceful uh, people and culture. And I think we can make anything happen, even though we might complain a lot sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually we, we actually have a tremendous amount of creative energy. And uh, I, I feel as though we, we need a little bit more regulation in terms of uh, artist opportunities. Sometimes I don't think all of the opportunities uh, trickle down, so to speak, uh, the way that they should. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, I know some of the elements why, but we need persons in the positions who understand the significance of certain opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I, I think we just need the, the people who have uh, the right positions mm -hmm. to reach out to persons who have the right type of knowledge, right, and experience in order to make the connection, right? And that's how we, we're going to see, uh, I think, a dramatic shift in the momentum in our creative culture. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Keisha, I'm going to have to bring you back at some uh, later time because I'm, I mean, there's so much in, in this field and, and you, you live it because you live, you're doing living art. I call it living art. Um, you got art intervention. Um, it just keeps, I could see it, it just keep growing and involving. So we would like, on um, behalf of Madam Producer and myself, um, 
I can think about with myself to thank you for being on the show with us today and sharing all of these nice nuggets and up inspiring people to see the quality of work that can happen, um, particularly in the arts, because we only tend to like to look at doctors, lawyers, accountants, uh, and so forth, and, and the academics, or pure academics, for instance, to see. And we push all our children to go that route, but we, I always say we're kinetic, pe kinetic people, and so the more we could get a balance, then the better off we'll be as a whole, and so forth. So we like to thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Sharing the time. I know we said an hour, but um, we, we, <laughs> I felt that we can do you injustice by cutting you off, so <laughs> we didn't do so. So you're quite welcome, and thank you for supporting us. Yeah, man, it was my pleasure. And thank you for the conversation. You know, every time I answer a question, you know, it causes me to think. And when you think, we generate. So it's always good. Yeah. So folks out there, please do share, 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 share um, this conversation so that um, all of the youth and whoever else is inclined will be able to learn from it. Hopefully it's a value to yourself, uh, yourself out there on social media and the like digital reaches the world so I know some of y'all are all over the place um, like I say if you want to you can also subscribe to the page so you don't miss any of the episodes that we have um, I think we are on 50 something now um, which is mind-boggling by itself considering I never wanted to start one of these things um, and so forth and so but by all means be safe um, vaccinate or isolate. That's what we say on the show. Um, we want you to be safe so we could be able to be around to enjoy a lot more of uh, Keisha and, and Monroe's work. And maybe you will be one on the show presenting some of your own work or whatever it is. So we look forward to that as we move forward. So thank you, Madam Producer. And thank you, Keisha, and again, Bahamas, 242, the world. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.